Hey, welcome to Highlands Fellowship, whether you're watching online or on our TV or on Facebook or internet or in the future, wherever you're watching this. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Tim and I'm the digital pastor here at Highlands Fellowship and it's an honor to meet with you today and I'm so glad that you're watching with us wherever you're watching from. Take a minute, go to the hub, hf.church slash hub and let us know who you are and where you're watching from. Um, if you're watching on the online campus, just leave a comment and let us know where you're watching from. And hey, today we're kicking off a brand new series. It's called Summer at Highlands. And we do this every summer, pretty much. It's a great time of fun and connection and just chilling out. You know, summer is one of my favorite seasons of the year. And I love this season at Highlands. So stick around, whether you're traveling or whatever. Make sure you connect with us every single week and watch online. And today we have a special message from Pastor James Dick, who is uh, our student pastor in Bristol. And we're going to do a recap of our student ministry camp that we had a couple weeks ago. And as well as he's got an amazing message about rest that all of us need to listen to. And hey, I wanted to give you a heads up before we get started. Um, sometime, like maybe right now, would be a good time. Go to the kitchen, grab a cracker or a piece of bread, grab some type of drink. And later on after the message, we'll do communion together. Okay, I'll be back. I'll see you after the message.
Well, hey, everybody, from wherever you are watching, uh, if you're up there in Bluefield, welcome, y'all. I got to hang out with Antoine at uh, our summer camp a couple weeks ago. Man, it was awesome. I love that guy. He was just great. Welcome to the Marion campus. Um, I learned something about Dave. If he ever invites you to eat hot wings with him, don't for yourself. Please don't do that. You will cry and hurt later. So just a warning about that, but welcome to the Marion campus. Uh, everybody at Bristol, man, I love you guys. It's been so great getting to see all the baptisms that have happened over the past few weeks and be with you guys has just been, I mean, incredible. It's just been so good. And then everybody else online and TV, I hope you guys, if you're watching on vacation, welcome back home, even though you're far away. Um, we are starting a new series today, Summer at Highlands. But before we get into that, um, I do want to talk a little bit about youth camp that we just got back from. We went to Centrifuge. Uh, we took 98 students or 97 students there, and it was just an amazing week. I mean, we saw students baptized and saved, and we got to celebrate next steps and rededications. Um, but I want you guys to check out this video real quick that shows some of the highlights from camp. So if you guys will check this out. Justice. 
makes the most of the money why? Man, hey, camp was awesome. I mean, it was just so good. I mean, getting to see, you know, high school boys cry like little kids is just, I mean, when they're moved by the Spirit is just some of my favorite parts of youth ministry and then getting to walk through baptism and what that looks like. Um, I think one of the coolest parts for me was when we got home, uh, some of the senior guys, they saw... I mean, they've kind of seen us pour into them for the past four years of their lives. And they came and they said, hey, I've seen now, I understand the impact of what it means to serve and to volunteer and to help out. And so high school boys came to me and they were like, we want to help with the next generation. We want to serve in the middle school ministry and be there for them the same way that you were there for us. And I mean, that just made me break down. I mean, that was just awesome. So a huge thank you to the church because, I mean, I know this was like kind of a youth ministry camp and, and we went to it, but so many of you gave towards it in Difference Maker. And I mean, I know, I know personally some of you guys who gave entire scholarships for kids to attend. I think we gave out like 15 or 17 full scholarships so that kids can come to camp and experience the love of Jesus and to escape the busyness of the world. And it was just amazing. I mean, it was so good. So for those of you guys who have poured into students in the past, like myself, or are doing it currently, or who gave to that, just from the bottom of our hearts here, thank you. Hopefully you've got to see some of the baptisms and things over the last few weeks, but it was just so, so good. So we're starting this new series, Summer at Highlands, um, and I was praying through kind of God, where would you have me speak? What would you have me speak on? Uh, when we were at camp and I was writing this message and I feel like God continually said, will you speak on rest? Like, can you speak on rest? And I was at camp and I was sleeping four hours a night and wrangling kids for 14 hours straight during the day. And I was like, I don't think this is a good time and God, <laughs> you know, I don't think this is good, but I couldn't get out of it. So I didn't write this at camp. Uh, so if it's bad, it's just, on, it's just on me. But, uh, I wrote it when I got home and I've been praying through it and I, I never, I really rarely ever use titles to messages. Um, I, I like to kind of let the text speak for itself, but on this one, I feel like God gave me something maybe. Um, I, I want to title this message, Built on Busy. Built on Busy. So let's turn to the text, Psalm 127. Uh, if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to it. It'll be up on the screen. If you don't have your Bible, do not worry. Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon says this, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain, you rise early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for summer and, and crazy temperatures and times we get to enjoy outside. Thank you for a, a church camp that we got to see students come to know you for the first time. Lord, take next steps in following you. Lord, let that, uh, let that inspire us as a church that if, if teenagers are doing this, then who are we to not? Lord, just guide my words today. Lord, bear this for me. Let it not be me speaking, but you. Take out any sense of ego or pride that may be here and let this just be true worship to you. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. And we love you too. Amen. So built on busy, um, I was thinking about the American life and with summer. I mean, summer is known for vacations and rest and things like that. Um, and all that stuff is great, but I truly think that the average American life is built on busy. I mean, when I ask people how they're doing now in today's world, you know, it used to be everyone would just fake say, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, even if terrible things are, I'm doing good. But the more I talk to people and the more I say, how you doing, the more common it is for me to hear busy rather than even good. I mean, I'm busy. I got so much going on, works, all these things. And, and I mean, I've been the same way. I'm not here to, to throw stones. I, I am just as guilty as anybody else in this room. Anna and I are taking steps to get better at it, but I'm busy. I'm, I'm just, I'm busy. If I could just get, I'm, I'm busy. If I could just get a, re, a, a break. 
And I mean, I know there's lots of stuff with America. I know that there's lots of things. There's an election coming up. There's lots of sin that's, that's praised and worshiped. But really, I think one of the largest idols in America is busyness. I think it's just as guilty, if not more so, than any other thing for taking people away from experiencing a full relationship with Jesus. I mean, how true is it? Every single one of us, when we wake up, how easy it is to just get out of bed, go shower. Some of you guys not shower. I hung out with some middle schoolers the past couple of weeks that went throughout camp, you know. Some of you guys. But how easy is it to not shower and just hit the floor and immediately start the day and not even think about acknowledging the God of the universe? I mean, how easy is that to do? I mean, I'm guilty of it. How easy is it to go throughout life and to not acknowledge and I mean, I work with the next generation, so I see a lot of teenagers, you know, and, and they have earned the title, the anxious generation. The statistics show they're the most, that they are the most anxious generation of all time throughout history. And I think one of the core reasons, because there's social media, there's cell phone, there's all these things. I think one of the core reasons is how families operate. I mean, always going, always on the run never slowing down, never taking a break, never taking a Sabbath, but just always on the run for the idol of busyness, for the idol of busyness. And I know parents, I think, are probably just as anxious, to be honest. I think we hide it better in busyness and things that we're doing or things that we can escape life from. But I work with these students who are just, I mean, goodness gracious, high schoolers and middle schoolers who are just tired who just, I mean, they, they sleep in and because they, they, they can't fall asleep at night because they've been running all day and they get in trouble because they sleep in late and they're just like, I don't know, they come to me and they're just I don't know what to do. I think adults feel that same way. I don't know, how do I manage my life? How do I manage keeping a boss happy and coming home and being a good spouse and leading a good family? How do I manage being a good grandparent and leading my grandkids in a way that is honoring? How do I do that with so many things? And of all the scriptures about peace and rest and joy and all those things, um, I was listening to another pastor speak, and he said this is what he thinks is the best. And I was like, dude, I, that's, there's two verses here, but how? But then I read it, and I started digging into it, and I get it now. So Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. And Solomon is saying, hey, unless the Lord does it, and what's the point? Now, is he saying you shouldn't work? No, absolutely not. But I do think he's bringing into question why you work, why you labor, why you watch. Is it for my good? Is it for what? Or is it for God? God, if you are in this, let this happen, unless the Lord builds the house. And in other words, he's saying this, you can build a house, but if God isn't in it, it'll fall. You can build a family, but without God in it, it can and will crumble. You can build a business, but if God isn't in it, the business can fall apart. And at the end of the day, at the end of your life, none of those things you can take with you. But he's saying this, if the Lord isn't in it, what are you doing? And I feel the same way. I mean, when I go, I get to go hang out with students at school lunches. I'm very blessed to do that at some schools in Bristol. Um, and I notice when I walk in and when I think I got it all under control, like oh, I'm gonna go in, I'm just gonna go see the students, I'm gonna hang out with them and I don't pray before. Like, man, it seems like I cannot have any kind of conversation with any kind of worth. And it's just, I'm some weird old dude sitting at a table with a bunch of middle schoolers, which probably is right most of the time. But like, then there are also the times when I pray and I say, God, will you just bear this for me? Will you just take this weight? Can you, hang, will you give me the words? Give me the conversations when I walk into the school and then I walk in and these crazy things, I mean, the conversations are just so good. The people I meet, students will invite students from other churches and other places to be like, you gotta meet this guy. He cares enough to show up. And it's just crazy. And it's so simple. God, will you build this house? Will you be in this thing? It's the same way with preaching. I mean, I, when I get up here and I think, man, I got this thing, or if I speak on a, a text where I've spoken on it a hundred times before, and I'm like, oh, I've got this story, and I'll get up there and I will be a fool. I mean, I will just stumble over words and not get to the points and, and all those things. But when I say, God, if you will just take this, he will bear it. And another thing to know is that he's, he's willing and able and eager to bear it. Whatever is in your life, 
the struggles, what you're going through, the busyness, the anxious thoughts we're going to get to in a second. Uh, God is willing and able to bear it. And that's why Philippians 4, I mean, it's the most famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And if you know that and you believe that, then also subconsciously you believe this. That means without him, I can do nothing. That he's the oxygen that I breathe. Without his power in my life, working through me in his will, without him, I am nothing. I can do nothing without him. If I can believe I can do all things through him, that means without him, I can do nothing. Verse two goes on to say this, in vain you rise early and stay up late. In vain you rise early and stay up late. Hey, if you've ever been anxious about something, me included, man, I know that well. When something doesn't go right and you can't sleep at night and you wake up early, anxious. I mean, you guys ever wake up early, anxious about something? It happens to me every once in a while still. Like, oh, like it's, it's the worst. I mean, you feel like that knot in your chest and you're just like, I don't know. I, I was asleep a second. What did I do? You know, <laughs> how did I get here? And But just waking up early with that knot in your chest saying, God, what a... What do I do here? He says, in vain, you're waking up early. You're rising early and you stay up late. And says this, toiling, or in other words, anxiously working for food to eat. That you anxiously work hard and you do these things to eat and then all the stuff to anxiously work for food to eat. I think that's a real picture of a lot of people right now in America. Hey, and we like to focus on all the outside things and not address the core things in our lives. I, I'm guilty of that as well. But I think I know lots of my friends who say, I just can't sleep anymore. I, 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 I gotta do these things. I gotta go to these places. I got all these lists of things I have to get to. And a lot of them are good things for kids and families and work and earning money. I, I mean, I think all that stuff is good, but it can get to the point to where we toil for food to eat. Psalm, 20, Psalm 127, two ends with, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I think for some of you guys, I think that's enough. Probably to say, God, will you just give me sleep? And I think God is able, uh, he will give that. And I think he's a loving God in that. But it can also be translated to this from the Hebrew. And most of your Bibles probably don't say this, but if you look back at the Hebrew, it can be translated to this. He can either give sleep or he can give in your sleep. John Piper says this, he's a pastor and theologian, says this, do you believe that God can perform more good for those who trust him while they sleep than they can perform with anxious labor for themselves while awake? That God is a big enough God to perform enough and more for you while you sleep for those who trust him than you could ever do anxiously toiling while awake. Um, I know this well. Uh, my wife and I, we love to garden. And we, we have a big, giant garden. I shocked myself on it this year. I put an electric fence. Those things work. Get a tester. Don't use your skin, by the way, if any of you guys are wondering. Um, we put in a big, giant garden. But before we got married, we were engaged. And I was talking, you know, we were dreaming about being married and, and having life together. And one of the things Anna always wanted was a garden. Um, and so I was like, I'm gonna be husband of the year. I'm gonna go make a garden. I never, I mean, I raised one for like 4-H when I was like a tiny little kid, but I didn't know how to garden. So I looked up a bunch of YouTube videos and I read books and uh, Steve Robinson let me use his tiller and I, I tilled up a hill and down a hill and I, I broke my back working on this. I mean, I, I made sure every weed was taken out. I got on my hands and my knees and, and I, I mean, I toiled anxiously over this thing because I wanted it to be perfect for Anna. Uh, I, I hoed the rows together. I measured the depth of the seeds and how far apart they're supposed to be spaced. And I planted this whole entire, I fertilized all the things and I watered it. And I went down the next morning, nothing happened. Of course, seeds didn't grow. You know, so I was like, okay, well, I'll water it. So I watered it again. I went back up. I did my day. I went back down there the next morning, nothing, not even lettuce. You know, I was the one thing I don't even like. I was like, what, what, God, what? And day after day, I kept going back thinking, man, if I could just will this to grow, I'll, I'll do extra work. I'll work whatever it takes. This stuff needs to grow faster because that's my expectation. And now I look back at myself and I realize how, you know, goofy that is for a, a good word. To, like, what? I was like, what are you doing, man? But I wonder how many of us in our lives does God look at that like? anxiously toiling over the things that will happen and do in his time, 
in the way that he designed, but having this sense of this incorrect sense of control to stand over our lives and say, I got this under control. I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna do it. I wonder how God views us in that. There's a story of a man asking Jesus kind of the same question. And so it's in Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. It says this, the rich and the kingdom of God is the header. Verse 16, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And he, he's already got a problem right there. He, he, I can earn it. What good thing must I do? And Jesus asked, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you ever want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which one? The man inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the guy is kind of tricked. He's like, I got it. I've done it. He said, I've kept all of these, the young man said. What do I still lack? In verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He gives this man a challenge and he really gets to the heart of what this guy cares about. Go sell everything. It's verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What do we do when life gets busy? And really the question I wanna ask you is this, is, if your, is your life built on busy or is it built on trust in God? This guy gives up the chance to follow Jesus Christ in the flesh, working miracles, seeing him. He, he gives that up for money and for wealth. And I'm not here trying to give a prosperity gospel where I'm just gonna say, give and God is gonna bless you. I think that there's some scriptures we can talk about that later. But if you wanna stay away from an anxious life, if you wanna stay away from a busy life, I wanna give you one simple thing and that is give. That is give. There's other things, spending time with God, and we're gonna get to that. But here's the deal, is I, I believe that God can do more with my 90% than I can do with my 100%. I believe God can do with more with my six days a week than I can do with my seven days a week. If you wanna stay away from an anxious and busy life, there's nothing better to do aside from just spending time with him than to give if that's financially, if that's giving your time and seeing God bless that and other people. It's so, so good. But how often do we just say, well, I just don't have time right now. Man, my life's just so busy right now. I just got too much stuff right now. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16 says this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer God a sacrifice of praise. And we do that and we worship and all that. The fruit of the lips that openly profess his name. And then 16 says this, and do not forget to do good and share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And listen, if you're still questioning about tithing and all that, I, I get that, we can talk about that later, but I would encourage you to at least try being outrageously generous with someone. Just try it. If it's a waiter or a waitress, leave a tip greater than what you paid for the food. Do something outrageously generous and watch how that anxiety reacts. Of, oh, I gotta manage this. This is my thing. This is my, my, just try it. Just try it. And here's why, is because God will rarely use what you think you need. If he, if he did this otherwise, otherwise we would think that we we're in control. If he just gave us everything that we thought we needed at all times, we would think, I got this. And we see this all the way throughout scripture. The biggest one is Gideon. It's an Old Testament story. He's facing off uh, against the Midianites. The Midianites had 135,000, a huge army. I mean, massive, 135,000. Gideon started with 32,000. And already it would be like, the only way they win is if God shows up. What does God do? God shrinks it. He shrinks it, and then he shrinks it, and then he shrinks it down to 300. 300 versus 135,000, and they have victory. God will rarely use what you think you need. Another one is Moses. 
led the nation of out, of out of Israel to freedom, to the promised land. Moses says, God, I have a speech impediment, God. I, I don't speak well. I, don't, I, can't, I can't do this. We just get, we just send someone else. God uses Moses. Why? Because God will rarely use what you think you need. David, King David, a man after God's own heart, the youngest brother, the smallest, the one tending the flock, the one not with the brothers at war, God uses David and says, hey, I don't look at the heart, or I don't look at the outer appearance, I look at the heart. God will rarely use what you think you need. And the last one, and my favorite, is Caleb and Joshua. Is this is after Moses, they get to the promised land and they send out 12 spies to go look at the land and to bring back a report because that's what a wise army does is, what are we up against? And 10 of them come back and say, the people are too big. The cities are too fortified. They're like giants. And we are like little tiny insects. It's too hard. But then Caleb and Joshua say, no, I know the God that we serve, the one who parted the Red Sea, who led us by a pillar of fire, who protected us, who saved us from, I know the God. But because the 10 say it's too big, people are too scary, the nation wanders in the desert for years and years until they all die, except for Caleb and Joshua, who get to see the thing that they believed in. They get to, Joshua leads the people into the promised land, and it's this moment. God will rarely use what you think you need. Hey, if you're here today, and you're like, and you came in, you're anxious, and you just have so much going on, or you're watching online somewhere or on TV, and you just feel like, man, my life is just a constant chaos, and I can never catch a break, and I'm always worried, and I can't sleep at night, I, I can't do it. What do, where do I go? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, not busyness, not anxiety, not, I will give you rest. And he gives a command. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I wanna ask you this, what is in your life that won't allow you to rest? For some of us, it is busyness. And it's just taking back our schedule and giving it to God and saying, God, you have my time. Returning back to a Sabbath, a day of worship for him. For some of us, there's a sin that we hold on to that we just will not admit, that we won't give over to God. And we think, well, I can manage this thing and I got it on my own power. I got it on my own accord. And God says, hey, when you come to me, you give everything. But the good news is that all can come to him. You don't have to work hard like that guy thought, well, I, I, what must I do to get eternal life? What, what must I earn to get? But you don't do any of that because God sent his son to die on a cross for myself and for you so that we can know him and have a relationship with him and go throughout life when everything gets crazy, that people can look at you and say, how do you have so much peace? How do you, how, how is when the house is being built, how, how can you rest? And you can answer, because the Lord's building it. It's not in my hands, my finances, my time, my energy, my schedule. I just give it to God. And I say, God, will you take it? I want to end with this um, as we start off summer is we get to see why we can rest in that through the, through the picture and just the amazing moment of communion. Of when Jesus says this, he says, and he took the bread and gave thanks for it and he broke it give, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in verse 20, it says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Listen, please don't live a life built on busy. Please don't live in a house built on busy. Please don't stand watch in busy, but instead rest in him, that he has a still, small voice that we hear when we spend time with him. Steve talked about it last week, the value of spending time in his word 
of spending time in prayer with God the Father, the creator of the universe, who can do more for us while we're asleep than we could ever fathom doing while we're awake. And that he also can take the debt that is sin and pay for it on a cross and conquer death so that you and I can spend eternity with him. And if that's you, you've never acknowledged that or invited him into your life, I'm gonna say a prayer in a second where you can invite him into your life for the first time and make the decision, I'm gonna follow him, I'm gonna search after him with, through all of my life that he has the breath in my lungs, it's not mine anymore. But also for those of you who are here today that you know him well and you just feel like you're struggling, I'm gonna pray after that and I just wanna give you a moment to just say, God, will you just give me rest? that you say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened. I want, I'm just gonna ask you and say, hopefully you're challenged that, to change your schedule and to give up the things that you hold so tightly to if it's a sin, if it's something that's going on in your life and just say, God, this is yours. So will you pray with me? Dear Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, Lord, will this, be, will this just be the day they give their life to you? If that's you, just say, just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. But Lord, I believe you gave your son to die for me on the cross. Lord, I believe he conquered the grave. God, I wanna repent of my sins. I wanna turn away from my past and I wanna follow you with everything. I wanna live in your peace. I wanna live in your joy and I wanna live in your rest. And hey, if that's you with everybody's heads down and eyes closed, um, I'm not gonna make you do anything crazy right now. I am gonna challenge you to tell somebody. If it's someone in your family, if it's a pastor at your campus, to let someone know, today I made the decision to give my life to Christ. And then for those of you who just feel beat down, that you've been in a wheel of chaos that will not stop turning, I wanna pray for you too. Dear Lord, I just lift up my brothers and sisters here. And Lord, in myself, who just feel caught in chaos. Lord, that we've, we've been building a life on busyness. Lord, will you just give people rest and peace beyond understanding? That when life starts to spiral, we know you are there to hold firmly onto. Lord, give us the hope of your son. Lord, give us the love that it takes to go into the world and to be those that resemble you well. God, thank you so much for loving us. And we love you too. Amen. Hey, someone at your campus uh, is going, or online, is going to lead you through communion. It's what we do in remembrance of Jesus giving his body and his blood so that we can know him. So I wanted, I wanted to kind of start off summer with remembering this is why I can rest. It's not what I earn. It's not what I do. It's solely through Jesus going to the cross, bearing my sin and weight for me when I didn't deserve it. Hey, I love you guys. I hope you guys are gonna have a great summer. I know we've been had a blast with baptisms and all the growth and things, but I just wanna encourage you to don't build a life on busy, but build it in trusting in God. Thank y'all, I love you. Have a great day. What an amazing message from Pastor James about rest and spending time with God, and slowing down. And as he mentioned, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to do communion right now. And so if you haven't uh, prepared for that, just go to the kitchen, uh, grab a piece of bread, grab a cracker, any type of food that you can consume, and grab some type of drink, water, juice, whatever you have. Um, and let's get ready to do this together. And as we do this, there's three things that I like to do. Number one is I like to reflect. When Jesus told us to do this, he said do it in remembrance of him. And so as we do this, we're supposed to reflect on what Jesus went through. This is his body being broken. This is his blood being poured out for my sin and for your sin. And so we're supposed to reflect and we're supposed to thank him and praise him for what he did for us so that we can have a relationship with him, not just in heaven, but here on earth. He said he came to give us an abundant life. And so uh, reflect, think for just a minute, give him praise of all that he's done in your life, what he's done for you, what it means for him to die on the cross. And the second thing we do is we repent. The Bible also is very clear that if you're not a Christian, um, you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. And also if you're a Christian and you have a problem with somebody else or you have a sin, unconfessed sin in your life, 
that you need to take care of that before you do um, communion. So right now, repent. What sins do you need to ask Jesus to forgive you for? Your sins are forgiven. They're wiped away. They're clean. They're, you're cleaned already. But it doesn't mean that we don't confess and repent of the sins that we have in our lives. So take just a second and do that. You and I both have sins that we can repent. And finally, the third thing is to rejoice. God did all of this so that we could have a life with Him. Like I said, it's not just to go to heaven. It's an abundant life here on earth. It's a a life full of ups and downs, highs and lows, as we just wrapped up that series last week. Um, But we're to rejoice in what God has done and how He has taken care of us, how He meets our needs. He is so faithful to us even when we are not faithful to Him. So let's praise God for what He has done in our lives. And I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. This is Paul saying, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. Grab your piece of bread or your cracker or whatever you may have. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take that. And then verse 25 says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink this. Let's, Let's pray. God, we give you praise. God, we reflect on what you've done, what you've accomplished. God, we repent of our sins. We ask for forgiveness. We ask that you help us to stay strong and to follow you, to spend time with you, to to try our best to be like Jesus every day, Lord. That's our mission in life. Lord, forgive us when we fall short of that. And Lord, we praise you for all that you've done in our lives. Again, we thank you for being faithful. We thank you for providing for us, for taking care of us, for meeting our needs. We're so blessed. Even if we get focused on the negatives in our lives, we are so, so blessed. So thank you, Lord, for all you do. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins so that we can have eternal life with you and an abundant life here on earth. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're here today and you made any type of decision, please let us know about it. Just go to hf.church slash hub and fill out the about you section and let us know what your decision is. Let us know how we can pray for you. Um, And this is, uh, again, we're doing Summer at Highlands, so uh, Summer at Highlands is a great way to stay connected. Join us every week online if you can't make it in person. Uh, Also, download our app. Download the Bible app. Um, Go to the hub, and there's the resources button at the very bottom. There's lots of ways there where you can get connected. There's studies on our website you can do, Bible reading plans, lots of ways to get connected. So uh, thank you again for joining us today. I hope this message and this service was challenging and inspiring and encouraging. And we'll see you next week.